Welcome to Data Structures and Algorithms in Java. This is my attempt at making a presentation about this, or yeah, not a SoundCloud lecture like my cool professor, but I hope that this will be interesting for you. Uh, to start off, a little bit about who I am. I go to school at York University. I'm going to my fourth year. I'm very nervous about graduating. And I'm in the Shopify dev degree program. So that means I do internships at Shopify. And like they pay for my education as well. So it's a really good program. So if you are still in high school or you're like not in university and you're looking for something, then you should apply for this program if you're interested. And I also work currently as a data engineering intern at Shopify. And concurrently, I'm doing an internship at Twitch as a software engineering intern. And if you have any questions about this, then yeah, you can write them in chat or like we can do a Q&A later about like this kind of stuff. And also I have a YouTube channel, which is just my name because I'm not creative. And you can see like all these things like me working at Shopify or at Twitch and that kind of stuff. Like I just posted a video about my first week at Twitch. So if you're curious about that kind of thing, yeah, curious. <laughs> I'm sure you guys are curious. So you can check that out. And going into what we're going to talk about today. So today we're going to do a quick intro to Java. So like the syntax and the language and how to do coding interviews. So if you're interested in what that's like and you can post questions in the chat, like I really recommend either unmuting yourself and asking questions or putting questions in chat for when I'm going through any of the slides or any point in time. And I will answer those because I have the chat right there, I can see it. And after that, we're going to go into some basic data structures such as arrays and strings, hash tables, linked lists, stacks and queues. I, I really do enjoy trees and graphs, but I thought that it would be too much to put in this lecture because those are a huge topic on their own. And definitely you'll see those in coding interviews, but it's just like a little bit too much information to stuff into your brains. And then if we have time, we'll go through some sorting algorithms, which are also fun to see. And I'm sure you have all heard of some of these. I, I always forget how they work. So I think it's interesting to go through them. And it's yeah, we'll see if we have time for that. So to start off with, what is Java? So Java is basically a popular programming language created in 1995, which is before I was born and probably before you were born too. And it's owned by the company Oracle and like billions of devices run on Java. And the two major um, IDEs that people usually use Java with or to code in Java are Eclipse, which is pretty garbage in my opinion, or IntelliJ, which is what I would recommend for you to use if you want to code in Java or literally like any language. Like I use it to code in Golang and like I use PyCharm to code in Python and like anything by JetBrains, like the company is really good. So I recommend using that. So let's go into an example program. Or this is, okay, ignore the green underlines. <laughs> That's just my, like, just replit being weird. So basically every line of code that runs in Java must be inside of a class. So in this case, we have a public class called factorial, just as an example. And a class should always start with an uppercase first letter. And inside of the class, you can see on line number, or is it on line number two, uh, the main method is defined. So the main method is actually required in every Java class. You don't see this a lot in like other programming languages, I guess, but I, yeah, it's required in Java or like you have a similar thing in Python. And so, uh, so yeah, any code inside the main function is going to be, or main method will be executed. And you don't have to understand these keywords like the public static void, but basically it just means like public means that people can access this. Like it's, if this is like an API or something, people will be able to access it. Static means something with object oriented programming. Void means nothing is returned. And main is the name of the, uh, of the method. And then the string with the brackets, it's like the data type that you're passing in. So it's going to be on like um, an array of string type. And then args, it's basically like if in this case, like for the main method, it would be the arguments that people type into the input of like their like command line or whatever, or their terminal. That's like the args that they're talking about in this case. But in the case of the other method that we see, which is factorial, it's like the actual data that we're passing in. So in that case, it's like in this for loop, whatever they pass in on line number five, like whatever the um, number i is, is what's going to be passed in. And 
yeah, this is how you do a for loop. On line number four, that's how you write a for loop in Java. And it's on line number three, it's how you instantiate a constant. So they use the word final. And I think this makes sense. It's just the syntax in Java is kind of weird. And it was one of the first programming languages I learned, which I would recommend learning it as one of the first programming languages. I think it's really good to make you like a stickler for knowing your types and like typing out things and like being very explicit with what you want to do. Because if you learn Python first, then you're just like, I don't care. <laughs> like I will write whatever I want and it will somehow work. But with Java, like you have to make sure that you're typing things out or like with C or like C++, you have to know what you're doing. So I think it's pretty good. It gets you into that mindset and you're going to need this in the real world. Like even with Python, uh, like you're going to, like if you're actually coding something in Python, you're not gonna just leave it untyped. You're not just gonna say, oh yeah, like on line number nine, you wouldn't just say result equals one. You would actually like type it, like write out the type or something somehow, like, or at least in the methods, you would say what type you're sending, what type you want to be returned to be more explicit. So that's like, if you actually work at a real company. And then let's go into coding interview tips. So, I have done a bunch of coding interviews and have videos about it on my YouTube channel. If you want to see those, like my Twitch interviews, I also interviewed like Figma and some other companies and those are interesting. And basically what I would recommend is finding resources and strategy strategies that work for you. So it depends on who you are. I recommend trying out different things. And basically it's sometimes I'm more of like, I have to actually do it myself. Like I can read the theory and understand it. And that's kind of how I went into some of my interviews. Like I just knew the theory. And then I was like, whatever, I'll just see what happens. And I didn't really practice, but I thought it was okay. Like I, I didn't fail my interview, so that was fine. But it's really good to practice. And a lot of the times there are actual like courses online that go through the patterns of different types of algorithms. I think those are really important to learn after you learn your data structures very well, is to go into different types of algorithms, such as like sliding window or two pointer and that kind of stuff. So you can find those online. And basically studying a bit every week is better than cramming a few nights before an interview. I have <laughs> definitely crammed a few nights before an interview or literally like the day of or the day before just because interviewing might take a few months and you might not want to uh, like continuously be preparing, but it's still better to do a little bit every single week just to keep you, like your skills fresh. And I would say study in a depth first manner, depth first search manner. So like that means to deep dive on one or two topics for a single week and do a, mu a bunch of questions in that. So if you go on leak code or something, you can filter and say, I want to just do like array questions and then just do those until you get tired and then move on to like, I don't know, like stacks or something and then do something like that. And also like try to keep track of the different patterns you find. And then, yeah, and also, I say focus on understanding at first and then on optimization and speed of solving the problems. So at first you're going to get very frustrated when you solve these questions because you might not understand it and you might jump quickly to like the discussion answers or like the solutions. But like over time, you're going to get better at this kind of stuff. And after you understand it, then you can focus on, okay, I want to make my solution like not brute force solution. I want it not just to pass the test cases. I want it to be super optimized. And I also want to solve these problems like under 20 minutes or something for like this specific level or this specific type of question. So you can set those goals for yourself over time. And also I would say studying with friends make things more fun or like you can use websites like Pramp or like there's like interviewing.io and stuff like that. And you can practice how an actual interview would be like so there are also like a bunch of programs, like I was in the Facebook ABCS program, so above and beyond computer science. And that was really fun because they pair you up with like a cohort of students who are also in university and like a similar level to you in this type of stuff. And then you get to be like taught by Facebook engineers, like each week you meet, and then you get to be put in breakout rooms and try to solve problems. And that kind of made me less nervous about talking about these problems in front of different people. So I recommend trying to sign up for those types of programs if you can find them. And then when doing an interview, these are the steps I would say you should follow, like the format is A, B, C, D. Like this is the easiest way to remember. Like I've heard many others, but this is the simplest. And so as I ask, so understand the problem and ask clarifying questions. 
you can break these down and be like, okay, the first three minutes of your interview, ask these questions. The first, the next five minutes, do this. But it, you, even when you're in the interview, it never ends up being that way because first you do introductions and you don't know how long that's going to take. And then the question might be super simple and you don't need to ask that many clarifying questions. So don't be super rigid on like timings, but definitely you can like make a, like a goal for yourself for different things. But basically the second step is brainstorm. So that means thinking out loud and planning your solution. And if you do A and B really well, then doing C and D are super easy. So, oh yeah, let's go through what you would say in the ask step. So you would say like, what data am I going to be provided? So you can ask the type of data. So is it just going to be like a string or is it could be an int? And what format is it going to be? Is it always going to be sorted or could it be unsorted? Then what data am I expected to output? So the same thing, like type and the format of the data. And then you can ask, like, do I need to transform my data before computing it? Like, do you need to sort it or do you need to do something to it? And does this problem remind me of other problems I have seen before? So can you draw up any inspiration from them? So that's why I was saying earlier, it's really good to know specific patterns so that you can draw inspiration from them. Like you might have never seen this problem before, which are like in my interviews, even though I had barely practiced for some of them, like I could still draw inspiration from other things I had seen. And I was like, oh, I know this type of pattern might work. So I would explain first, always in your interviews or anything, like explain the brute force solution. So like, oh yeah, I know that this thing might be O of N squared, like uh, time complexity or space, whatever. Like it's very bad, but this is how I would explain it. Like I'm not going to do it, but I'm going to tell you that this is the first solution I can come up with. And then you try to brainstorm other things and you can think out loud or you can type it out like as comments. And that's what I usually like to do because then it's more like visual and people can see like what your thought process is. And a lot of the times the interviewer will copy and paste everything that you typed and like put it in like some Google doc or something when they have to like review if they want to hire you. So I recommend typing things out because they might not remember, even though they are typing stuff on their own machine and like keeping track and making notes, just do that just in case. And then yeah, brainstorming is like rereading the question out loud that might like help you like catch different things that you might have not seen the first time. And then going through each of the examples that they provide you, if they provide examples, and also make notes and diagrams. You can do that in comments or like a lot of people use, I think it's called CoderPad. I always forget the name. I'm pretty sure it's CoderPad, but a lot of companies use that and then it has a whiteboard feature so you can draw stuff there, especially for things like linked lists or trees. It's very useful because those are more visual uh, data structures. And then after that, it's super easy to complete something because you've already brainstormed like the solution. You already said like, these are the things that I need to do. And then you just code it. Like it's, it's super simple. And then develop, it means to test and optimize your solution. So optimization, maybe you might not have time for that, but you could explain like, this is how I would optimize it. Or your interviewer might be like, they might try to prod you in different areas and say, oh, I, what, if, what if this happened? Or what if the project manager needed more, like they, needed, they didn't care about the space complexity. They care more about the time. So how do you work on that? And then how do you decrease the this time? So like, or the complexity of the time. And also writing tests. I think testing is important. Like a lot of companies, uh, they do this. I think a lot of people don't talk about it, but you do have to test your stuff. And yeah, knowing how to test in the language that you're using is very important. It's super easy in Python, which is why I use Python for like coding interviews, but Java is still good. And a lot of people use it. I was surprised like so many people, like even in the Facebook ABCS program, a lot of the interviewers or like not the interviewers, like the software engineers were showing us examples in Java because that's what they use. So that was interesting. And yeah, so writing test cases. So yeah, just like different examples, like similar to the examples that they provide you, but like try to test your solution on those and see if they're working and then debug like in the moment if you have to. Okay, too many things. Put your questions in the <laughs> chat. If, if I said anything that doesn't make sense or if you have more questions, please put it in chat. And now we can move on to data structures. Oh my God, so much talking already. So basically data structures are how we can organize data for efficient storage and modification. And also remind me at the end, I can talk about how like data structures are actually used in the real world. Because a lot of the times people say, eh, like data structures are only used in interviews, which is kind of true a bunch of times, but they're still used. I've seen like surprisingly a lot in the real world in like Shopify and at Twitch and stuff like that. So you can ask me about like which ones I've seen and that kind of stuff. 
And let's start. I was talking about this before, but if you don't know, time and space complexity. These are both expressed using big O notation. And this is something you'll go over in every course. Like you'll take a data structures course, they'll go over this. You'll take an algorithms course, they'll go over this. You might take advanced algorithms, they'll go over this because it's something that people need to be have drilled into their head. And basically time complexity just means like the expected amount of time that your algorithm will run. But it's not expressed in seconds or anything. It's expressed in big O notation, which is kind of interesting, but it's a good way to explain things so that people will understand and that it's like more general for each type of uh, solution that you have or algorithm that you have. And space complexity is the expected amount of space your algorithm is going to use. So for loops are generally big O of N. So that means you'll only have to go, like if you go through a loop, that means you're going, if you have N different items in your array that you're going through, for example, then you go, you're going to touch each of them N times. That's why it's big O of N. You're not going to touch them like n squared times or n cubed times. You're going to touch each thing once in a for loop because you're only going through it once. But with each for loop that you have nested within each other, it's going to multiply the complexity by n. So if you have two for loops inside of each other, it's going to be big O of n squared. Because if you have like two arrays that you're going to be going through, like so you have an x coordinate and a y coordinate for like some sort of graph, and you go through the x one, like that's in your first for loop, then you have to go through each of the elements in the y coordinate, like y array in the second for loop, and then it's just going to multiply. So basically what I say in the last point is like nesting different things is going to multiply them together in big O notation. But if it's in series, like some people are kind of scared about using multiple for like multiple loops in their solutions, but it's okay if you do one loop, you exit that loop, and then you do another loop. So say you first want to sort your array, you do that in one loop, and then you exit that for loop and then you do something else. Like then you solve your solution. So that means it's in series. So it's just addition. So that would just be n plus n, which is just simplified down to O of n. So if you have like O of 100 n, just simplify it to O of n. So people, they don't take like the constant numbers into consideration. And also the fastest comparison based sorting algorithms, which we'll talk about later, are big O of n log n time complexity. And that, there's like so many things you need to go into to explain this, which we do not have time for this, but algorithms are super interesting. They're very, or like data structures and everything is super interesting. And definitely search up like why this is the case if you are not familiar yet. And it's going to be super important to like remember these or not even just remember, but like understand why um, everything is like this type of time complexity or space complexity, because you're not just gonna be using this in interviews. like. I talk about this stuff regularly with my teammates at work. Like we'll be like, oh yeah, like let's think of this solution. Oh, but this is like not a good time complexity. Oh my God, this is gonna use so much space. Like this is gonna go through the database this way and it's just gonna touch everything. It's gonna be terrible. Like we can't do that. Or like if you've ever written a SQL query, like this is something I recently learned, but you can type in like before the SQL query, which is just like asking your database a question like, oh, do you have this element or something? So if you type in the words explain, analyze before that, then it will actually like show you what the query is doing internally. So it's like the, the explain, analyze is insane. And it will show you like where you need to optimize your query because I was doing a subquery inside of my query. Like there, it was more complicated. And that was touching every single element in the database. So it was making it super slow. And it was just like a terrible time complexity. So that's why I had to optimize it. So you will see these everywhere basically. So it's good to know this stuff and it's not just for interviewing, it's just for life in general, just to make things run faster. And like, you'll need this because like the query that I wrote was gonna time out. Like that's why I had to optimize it because it literally timed out because it was taking too long. So it would never have worked otherwise. Okay, <laughs> water break. <laughs> Let's go into actual data structures. So. Arrays, strings, and hash tables are the simplest ones that you'll learn. And they're all pretty similar because they're used for these types of problems that you'll see. So number one would be searching for something. Number two is reducing something or expanding something. And three would be computing some sort of value. Okay, arrays. You have probably all seen arrays, but it's still good to go into like the internals of how they work. So arrays are a data structure that contains a collection of elements. Usually they are related to each other. In Python, they're called lists, but they're called just arrays in Java. And 
Um, yeah, basically, like in memory, these would be stored as a contiguous chunk of data. So that's pretty different from other data structures because arrays, like in memory, they're going to be connected. Like they're they're going to be stuck together basically in memory. They're going to be one singular space. Like it's going to be like this space in memory is allocated for this array. And in Java, you have to specify the exact length of the array and it cannot be modified. If you want your array to change size, then you have to use an array list instead, which is obviously more convenient. But if you know that your array is going to be maximum 10 in size, then whatever, just use array. And um, at instantiation, the array is empty. And when we insert or delete from the middle, we need to actually shuffle all of the things over. So if I delete a number 63 over here, then we would shuffle like the 17, the 22, like everything else over in this array. And then each memory address is a hexadecimal. And for example, like integer arrays in this case, like each chunk of memory would be like uh, one byte. So it would be like zero. And it was in mean, hexadecimal would be like this. This is first one would be like zero X zero zero. And the second one would be zero X zero four. And then it would be zero X zero eight because each like because that's like the storage, that's the uh, space that each integer takes up in memory. And the, the first index of an array is obviously zero. For lookup times, so this is like going to the time complexity, it would just be O of one. So you would need to know these for all of your data structures. You need to know, especially in the specific language you're working in, like if you're going to be coding in interviews in Python, then you need to know the specific uh, time complexities for Python because some things, like a lot of people ask like this, like uh, using the keyword in when you're working with dictionaries or when you're working with, I forget what else, or like when you're using it in like for loops or something. Yeah, it's just like, I, I don't remember, but there's the keyword in and people ask like, oh, what's the difference in memory between, like, or uh, in time complexity between that and that? And you just explain it, but that's like something specific to Python. But for, for arrays in general, O of one lookup time, so that just means like, oh yeah, you say you want this thing at index zero, it will give it to you. You don't have to search for anything else. Like it knows to go to that place because it's stored contiguously in memory. That's what makes it like super fast to look up stuff because you know where it's specifically stored. You know where to get the thing. Whereas other data structures, you're like, oh, I don't know where to go. I have to ask the other person like in linked list. You're like, oh, I don't know how to get the third thing. I have to go to the first thing. The first thing has to tell me to go to the second. Then I have to get to the third. So arrays are more optimized for lookup and that kind of stuff. And insertion, insertion and deletion takes O of n time. Like I said, you have to shuffle things over all the time. And uh, let's see, like an example, this is how you would define an empty array of cars. This is how you would, this is like string type. And then you would add to it, but you can obviously do this. Like you don't even have to do line number three. You can just do immediately like line number four if you wanted, if you already know. Then you can also do an integer or like different types. To access an element, you use a square brackets. To change the element, you just say like, okay, which uh, memory location you want to change and then what you're changing it to. And to find the length in Java, you do dot length. And then to loop through or like loop through an array, you just go by index basically like over the length of the array. And you can also use a for each loop. And you can also have multi-dimensional arrays such as this one, which is like a 2D array. And then to access the elements like one refers to, like this would be zero and this would be one. So you go to one. So like the first and the second. So this is zero is always first, one is the second. And then you would go to the second, so zero, one, two, and then you have seven. So that's why I output seven in this case, which is kind of confusing. Like, the, <laughs> like when things become multi-dimensional, it just gets weird, but you'll probably have to do this if you need anything with graphs. And strings, strings, I because I learned Java mostly first as a programming language, I didn't realize that because Java kind of treats strings a little bit differently than arrays, but basically in Python, strings and arrays, like it made me realize, yeah, they're the exact same thing because a string is just an array containing characters. And an example here is you define a string, like you don't define it as like a list or anything as an array, but uh, it basically is one, like it just, it just an array of characters. And in, uh, like in Java, you're gonna use like dot to char or all these different things related to chars or characters or there's obviously like two uppercase to lowercase and you can find index of 
a specific uh, like piece of the text or like a sub sub array essentially like find me tell me where this sub array starts so that's why it outputs seven so it tells you where it starts and then hashing okay I'm gonna slow down does anyone have any questions <laughs> please put them in chat I'm gonna go back and then pause for questions because I'm sure people have questions about things or I don't know if you have questions. Anybody? Hmm? Wow. You know, I thought you people were curious, but I guess you're not. <laughs> so never mind. I guess I'll continue if you don't have any questions. So hashing. So before we go into hash tables, we have to talk about hashing. And hashing is an algorithm which takes an input of variable size and transforms it into an integer of fixed size. So here we're basically, we start with the keys. So we have basically a string value of names. So John Smith, and then we run it through some sort of hash function, which if you take this like, I don't know, there's an object oriented programming course at my school and we went through hash functions a lot. And I also took the cryptography course and we went through hash functions a lot. So internally it's very complicated or like it doesn't have to be complicated, but if you want it to be a good hash function, it will be complicated. But it basically like, oh yeah, we want to assign this information. We want to store it in an easier to consume way or like a safer way in case of cryptography. Like you want to, um, in cryptography, basically you want to um, hash passwords or like specific information so that people can't hack into it. So you use algorithms such as the RSA algorithm, which you can Google, it's very complicated, or like many different algorithms that I had to actually code, which was sad, but they are interesting to learn about. And in this case, um, what they're showing is that, or like a good hash function makes collisions rare. But in this case, say we use the hash function, function and then on John Smith and on Sam Doe, it computed the same value. So it hashed it to both be zero two. So that's not that great because we want, it's basically like we're trying to store data in different buckets so I can easily access it. And then sometimes when there's a collision, that means we have to actually like maybe store it as like an array of values or like as a linked list. So then like this zero two would point to, uh, like I think it's shown on the next one, like yeah, over here. So it would say like, okay, John Smith and Sandra D in this case both collided. And then we have to point uh, John Smith, like it's basically using a linked list inside, like internally, because there was a collision. So this is why, like, okay, we're this talk about hash tables, but basically a Java they're called hash maps, and they're slightly different, slightly like uh, it's, it's it, there, there's a little bit difference, but not too big. And then they're called dictionaries in Python, and hash tables rely on hashing, which is why I mentioned it. And the time of lookup, which is really good, is O of one, and you will see this used everywhere. And inserting and deleting is usually O of one, like I said, if it's a good, um, if there's no collisions, because then you know exactly like, okay, what's stored at, like we want to delete Lisa Smith. Oh, okay, find zero, zero, 001, because we know that in this bucket is stored the entry for Lisa Smith. So just delete that. And then like, that's just O of one deletion or insertion that kind of stuff. But then in this case where something collides, then it's pretty bad because then uh, you have to, might have to go through more than one entry and like have to search through like, oh, we want to delete Sandra D, then we can't just delete anything that's at 152. We have to go through and specifically find Sandra D because there was a collision. So that's why it could sometimes be O of N depending on the hashing function. And then, so this is how you will implement a hash map in Java. So you have to import it. And here is like a hash map of a string to a string. So you can define which values you want. It's usually like dictionaries or hash maps, hash tables. It's usually like a key to a value. So in this place, we're trying to map capital cities. So we're going to say, okay, put the country as the key. And then whenever I say like, oh, give me the city for England, like a capital city, then it will print out London. And we put in a bunch of different things and then we want to get England and print out London. We want to remove England or we can clear everything, like clear the entire hash map. That's how you do it in Java. And then if you want to get the number of items, like similar to the length of an array, you put, you just do dot size. Like that's the function that's implemented for hash maps. 
And then if you want to print out the keys and values, you can loop through them, like you can loop through the key set. So for each, well, in this case, it's a string as the key type in capital cities dot key set, print out the key. And then to get the value, you just do capital cities dot get at value. So if you had um, the string was England, then it would say the key is England, the value is London. Then it would say Germany, Berlin, and then et cetera. And basically, Basically, any you can map any object to any object. Oh yes, raise a hand. Oh yes, tell me, Yo Yo Panda, what do you want to say? Um, sorry, I'm just wondering, what's the difference between a hash map and a tree map in Java? Oh, do I even remember this? I don't even remember tree, tree map versus hash map. <laughs> Let me see. Oh yeah, 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 okay. This is the same as a uh, as hash. The same difference between hash table and hash map is the same difference between hash map and tree map, is that hash maps allow like a null key and multiple null values, but tree maps don't allow null keys, but can have multiple null values. So it's just with how they deal with nulls, essentially, like the null value. So I guess, I don't know, that's like the main difference that I can see online, but I'm sure there's more things. Mm. Yeah, oh, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's that's all I could find. But yeah, yeah, you can just. I'm sure you can use yeah tree map. I I've used that as well. But yeah, just my memory is bad because I haven't used Java in a while. But okay, going to oh yeah example problems. Let me slide over in this direction. So I have a few problems to go through. We'll see how much time we have. But this one is one that. Like I want to go through three problems. The first one is kind of similar to what you would see on Hacker Rank, like a very detailed um, explanation or story. And the other two are like leak code questions. Like I have them up here. And basically, I don't have time to code this probably in this session. So I wanted to show like the first the question, get your ideas, like either in chat or like unmuting yourselves, and try to follow like the ABCD format that we discussed earlier. Because I think that's really important to practice. And in this case, let's go through this question. It's related to the to like arrays, strings, and hash maps, or like and like that kind of stuff. So the simpler data structures. And I guess I will read this. Let me see if I can make this bigger. Or I guess it doesn't. But okay, Alice has n candies where the ith candy is out is of type candy type at element like at index i alice noticed that she started to gain weight so she visited a doctor the doctor advised alice to only eat n over two of the candies she has n is always even alice likes her candies very much and she wants to eat the maximum number of different types of candies while still following the doctor's advice given the integer array candy type of length n return the maximum number of different types of candies she can eat if she only eats n over two of them so we're provided with three examples. The first one is the candy type array is 112233. And the output is three. So the explanation is Alice can only eat six over two equals three candies. So like we said, she can only eat n over two of these. So the length, which is n, is six. So that's why we eat over two, like divided by two. So she can eat a maximum of three candies. But our question is asking, return the maximum number of different types of candies Alice can eat if she only eats n over two of them. Since there are only three types, she can eat one of each type. So there was, there was one, one, so that's one type. There's two, two, that's another type. There's three, three, which is another type. So therefore, there are three types, and there are three different, she can eat a maximum of three candies. So therefore, she can eat one of each of them. And the next, uh, in the next example, we have one, one, two, three. The output would be two because Alice can eat four over two, and she goes two candies. Whether she eats types one, two, one, three, or two, three, she can still only eat two different types because of this like boundary, essentially like this limiting factor. Even though there are more types, she can still only eat two candies. And this last example, we have six, 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 and then the output is one because Alice can only eat the number n over two candies. So she can only eat two candies. But even though she can eat two candies, she only has one type. So therefore, the answer is still one. So I was wondering 
what questions would you ask your interviewer? So if we were going through, if you were in this situation, you were given this as the first question in your interview, then what type of questions would you ask? Like about say the input or just like, what are those called? Like clarifying questions. So do you have any ideas in the chat? What questions would you ask about this problem? Because this is going to determine your solution or like which solutions you take. Anybody? Like, I think we understand that it could be integers. Like, there's not going to be, like, a decimal value or something. There's not going to be a string that's sent in. Or do we know that, it's, like, it needs to be divisible. Like, it, it's, and then we know there's even number that's, uh, that's going to be sent us to us. But I don't think that really matters in this case. But what about, let's say, what about sorting? Like, would you ask any questions about sort? How, if this, like anything about this data being sorted or not? So you can, you can ask the interviewer. Wow, this, this crowd is not participating. <laughs> yes, Victor, what do you want to say? It's more of a comment. Uh, the, there are questions being asked. However, they're in the in-call messages channel of Google Meet. In what? I know I'm, oh, I'm scrolling. Oh my God, I wasn't scrolling. Sorry, sorry. I was stuck on one point. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Wow, I'm so bad. Thank you. My, my, I wasn't scrolling down. Okay. Is there always sorted? No, it is not. Yeah, that's a good question. Sorry, guys. I'm bad at this. What are the numbers in there? Okay, yeah, the numbers in the array, they signify the different type of candy. So like number one could be chocolate. Number two is like strawberry or something like that type of thing but just as integers. Uh, what format does the input come in? Yeah, as an array. Um, what was the other question? Oh yeah, what are the bounds on n? Yeah, no real bounds other than we say earlier that somewhere it says that, yeah, n is always even. That's only bound on n. Let me see if there are any other questions. Oh my goodness. I missed everything. I'm so sad. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing the in thing in Python. Uh, I'm so bad at looking at chat. <laughs> no. OK, well. Uh, oh, yeah. OK, Dawson, what, do you, what kind of solution do you think you would want to do in this case? Build a frequency table. So what would, like what data structure would you use for that? And like, how would that help you? Arrays, probably hash table. Okay, so if we wanted to use arrays in this case, well, it's already an array, so I don't know, like, uh, what can you, either you change, you modify the array somehow or use a different array or like you're saying, yeah, hash maps, hash tables, like, I guess, yeah, count the number of occurrences, but how does it, how does knowing the number of occurrences help you in this case? Like basically, like in, in that case, you're, yeah, so if you go integer, integer, or yeah, yeah, it's not going to be typed to number of occurrences, it'll just be map of an integer, integer, so you would say like, Oh, we saw number one like two times. We saw number two, two times. We saw number three, three times. But basically does that, yeah, so you, you could sort it first as well. So let me type some stuff out. So uh, if you sort it, so sorted, then already the solution is going to be n log n. That's not good enough. We, whenever you're solving a problem, you do not want the solution, like your goal is to make it O of N. If you have to sort something, like if this was provided in unsorted order and your solution wanted it to be sorted, if it then is going to already be this, it's already going to be that. So then what will be the brute force solution is 
yeah, is to loop through it. So, so yeah, brute force would be to like go through, yeah, loop through the array using two for loops to like count the number of occurrences. This is already worse. This is already O of n. Uh, what is the thing squared? It's already worse. So using just keeping it as a race. Well, is iterator fast? Is it faster than for loop? Mm, like this. This is this is not the most optimal solution. Like that's not like because the thing that you're trying to do is not going to be solved by an iterator. Like it's still like a you're still like trying to count like oh how many occurrences of this thing are there if it's not sorted and it, or even if it is sorted it's still going to take it's still going to be a brute force solution. But do we care? Like, this is my question. We, do we even care about the number of different ones? Like, do we care that there are five of type one? Yeah, we don't care. We don't, in this question, that's like the thing that's twisted about this question that, that makes it different. So for loop to log the keys for each different number, then we break when the length surpasses n over two. To log the keys. Why would we break to like how would then output the length if it doesn't? No, but then you're but then you're just not going through the rest of the array, you're just gonna go through half of the array. Is that what you're saying? Like, you're just gonna break at this, like, what? <laughs> like, as long as like you, then you might not hit all the other ones, okay? So, basically, if we so how many distinct types? Yes, Dawson, we need to find a number of distinct types. So, basically, if we go through this question again. This is why it's important, like this question, that's why I'm saying like in the brainstorming session, you have to read the question again because like all of us missed the part. Like we all immediately jump to, oh, we have to count everything. You don't have to count everything. We don't care about that. Really what we care about is how many distinct types there are, how many different types. It, we don't care about how like there's four of type one. We don't care about that really. Like, so basically we, the first thing that we need to do, this is like the brainstorming session. The first thing, what do you think we need to do? So Alice has n candies and we need to calculate what n over two is. So basically we need to find the length of the array. So whatever candy type is, we need to find whatever the length of that is because then we know what's that limiting factor. Yeah, so we need to, Oh yes, we can get the length of the array, use a for loop to make a different array with unique types. So like counting one once and so on, and then divide the length of the original array by the length of the unique array. Probably not the most optimal solution. We divide the length of the original array. Yeah, so that's basically that's that's getting closer, Nico. That's getting closer. That is that is getting closer to the most optimized solution. So the second thing that we're looking for. So first we need to find the length of the array. Then what's the other limiting factor is we need to find, we need to find the number of distinct uh, candy types. See, this is why I'm tricking all of you guys because I didn't teach you this. <laughs> Because this is this there was there was a prerequisite and I didn't teach it, but I wanted to see if, <laughs> if people would get it. Yes, you could use a set. <laughs> Thank you, Doss. This yes, I tricked all of you. We, there's another data structure that we can use for this. <laughs> or yeah, 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 yeah. Hash set. Yes. <laughs> yes. Omega lol. I, I I trolled all of you. There's using a set. You, oh, yeah, set for this. Yes. Use a set and find the length of it find the length because there's like this is why data structures are so useful if you know them and then the third thing would be uh return the lower of the two because which one whichever one's the limiting factor is what you return so if we actually go to the solution it's extreme okay ignore the red underlines because um i didn't import things like so basically whatever pretend we have a class called candies and then i'm just going to call it like in the main um, we define the object candies and then say we make an integer array called candies and we send in one of the examples and we call the candies whatever, uh, call the candies function. Oh, I think I have to pass in candies. What am I doing? 
<laughs> or what am I doing with my life? <laughs> uh, okay, so we pass in the candies, and then this is the function that we are caring about. So basically, we pass in the array called candy type, which is one of the examples over here, line 67. We're going to calculate the number of candies, which literally we already defined over here. We define the length of the array, candy type. So let's just call it number of candies, which is candy type dot length. Then we're going to find the number that we can actually eat, which is the number of candies divided, uh, which we need to divide by two or whatever. Uh, why did I comment this out? Number to eat. Maybe we need to divide by two. Yeah, so I think that's what we need to do. Number, number that we can actually eat is divided by two. So yeah, hash set is set. It's, it's just uh, Java name things differently. Like they just define things a different way. So, oh yeah, there's also, oh, why did I spell it? Okay. Also, there's a question like, what if the array wasn't always even? We can think about that later if we want. Or like you can type out things in the comments. And in Python, this would be so easy. We should just be like, oh yeah, define this thing. We don't even have to say what it type it is. We just say, oh yeah, you need candies, which is going to be the int. We want to find the int. So we just say, convert candy type to a set and find the length of it. This is how extremely annoying it is in Java. So, um, so Java is kind of like weird that way. Um, yeah, it's terrible. This is like one of the ways. There are different ways, but this is pretty bad. And then basically we're going to, so, so basically this one line, I put it, I made it as two lines in Java. So first I created the hash set because it was extremely ugly. I made that in one line and then I found the size of it. So that's how many unique candies there are. And then basically if unique candies are less than the number that we can eat, we return unique candies. Otherwise we return the number we can eat. Or if we want to simplify this further, we like this, we can do it this way. Or we can just do it this way, return, okay, return the minimum of both. Yeah, just use whichever. So that, those are uh, two different ways. You can think about what would happen if this wasn't always even. Now I know to look at the chat because I'm bad. I feel like, okay, let me just pause and see if there are actual questions because I missed stuff and I'm sad. Where? Oh, yes. Uh, oh, trees and grass are your favorite part of CS. Very good, Dawson. You don't need to download anything, but IntelliJ, yes, good. No, 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 no. People can keep typing questions if they want. Oh, yeah, I did start an IDE war. Oh, you put my channel. Oh, my God, so cute. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, TypeScript is good. Be gone, web dev. Yes. Okay, I'll go back to this later. Okay, let's go. Let's go back to the slides. Mm. Okay, linked list. Let me drink water. Did I miss a slide? No, linked list. Okay. Linked lists are very fun, but very confusing for some questions like reversing linked lists, super confusing, <laughs> but we're not doing that question today, don't worry. So linked lists are a linear collection of elements whose order is determined by pointers between nodes. And we are usually given, or we have to declare a node class if we are given these types of problems. And the first node in a linked list is called the head, and the last node is sometimes called the tail, depends which, like how you define the node class and that kind of stuff. And linked lists are best used as stacks or as queues because they're optimized for removing from the head and not as efficient for lookups. Like I said earlier, when I was explaining why arrays are good for lookups, linked lists are trash for lookups because you have to go through a bunch of elements to find whichever one you need. But then there are so many questions that are like, find the kth element of a linked list. Do this thing k times, blah, blah, blah. like all this stuff with k. So if you're searching stuff up, those are the questions you might run into but they're fun, like linked lists are really fun. And it's it's basically like you store data, like you'll have a node class, and basically the two things you're interested in are what is the data stored here? So in this case, we might store a string and like that value would be A, and then we want it to point to what's the next place in the data, like uh, what's the next node essentially. And 
Linked lists are not contiguous in uh, memory. So that's why we need the pointer. We need to say, where are we storing this in memory? Point to that memory address so we know where to go to find it. So that's kind of why we can't do all this like easy lookup because we need the pointer to that thing. So that's kind of why linked lists are bad for that. And But linked lists, you might see them in the wild, I guess. Like if you're, like example, Spotify. Spotify, let's see, it would, you probably use a doubly linked list because you are you have like a playlist of songs and you want to go back and forth between them. Then you, you might have pointers pointing to the next songs. They're not going to be stored contiguously in memory because you don't want to store a bunch of them in like you don't want to copy them over to different places every time you make a playlist. You just have pointers pointing to them all over the place. And then that's kind of how it would work. But in a singly linked list, essentially, you know, they're only points to the next node in the list, doubly linked lists. We have back and forth next and previous pointers. And if you are given the head of a linked list, you have access to the entire list, which is what makes it great. And oftentimes, linked list questions in leak code problems will just pass in the head node into the function. Like you're not just going to get this whole like linked list thing being passed in. It's just going to be the head, and it's going to be like type node or whatever the node is called, like the class is called. So an example in Java, which honestly, like doing this presentation in Java just reminded me how ugly Java is. <laughs> so I'm sorry, but um, yeah, I'm guessing a look of time for yeah, linked list is on because you have to go through like you might have to go to the end of the linked list to find your thing that you're looking for. So it's, it's not the best. And so essentially, this is like one way you could define it in Java is to have a specific linked list class and then have an in like a class, like a subclass within it called node. And like I was saying, you would just store like example, like the data here could be an int or it could be whatever type you want it to be. And then you have a next pointer, but it's also of type node because like the thing you're pointing to is also a node. And you have a constructor to create a new node and next is by default initialized as null. So if, if we're not passing in next over here, like we could have another constructor because in Java you can have multiple constructors and we could have another node constructor and it could have like int d comma node n and then also assign whatever the next is supposed to point to. So you can do like multiple constructors as well, which is cool. And what we could also define here in this linked list uh, class would be an add method. And what makes linked list interesting is if you've never like coded one yourself, it's to try to figure out how to add something like to the beginning of the list, to the middle, to the end of it, or to delete something. Like deletion is the worst. It's like from the beginning, sure, it's easy. You just you point, you you remove the head and you point like a you're just like, oh yeah, head point to the next one, whatever, easy. But from the middle, it's bad. From the end, it's okay-ish. And then or find the find method could be like traversing the list, which is also like we said, O of N. So it's really like a fun exercise to implement a linked list or like any data structure, which you'll probably have to do at least a few times in your life. And but in interviews, you probably just need to implement this node class, which should take you like five seconds. And like it's really similar. Like it's simple. I mean, it's really simple. And in any language, it's gonna look like this, like really, really short. So that's what makes it like easy and yeah, it's fine. And okay, example problem. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Let's go into, I didn't want to do reverse linked list because I thought that was too complicated to explain because it's just too much drawing and people get confused. But I think I put it in the list of questions that I put. I don't remember, yeah. Oh my goodness. Uh, merge, this one. Merge two sorted lists. So this is a Leecode easy question. And basically merge two sorted linked lists and return it as a sorted list. The list should be made by splicing together the nodes of the first two lists. So in this case, yeah, we know we're given two linked lists. See, leak code questions are just like, they don't give you a whole backstory like hacker icons do, but they're just like, you get to the point and practice your data structures or like your algorithm knowledge. But I think in reality, you're going to see more questions like the, the one where we had like Alice eating her chocolates. Like you'll see way more of those in the real world, like, or those are like more fun questions, honestly, but these are really fun too as well. So in this case, we have an input, which well, they're just naming L1 and L2 as like the two linked lists. And they're just sending it as, they're just showing it as arrays essentially, but in theory, it's going to look like this. 
and they're just going to pass us the pointer to the head. So they're just going to pass us one, and then this one's also one. And in this case, so we need to return another linked list. Yeah, basically, that's the thing in this case. We were, we're just going to combine these two. We wanted to do it in an ordered fashion, yeah, sorted list. So that's like the main problem with this. And we also have base cases, which is interesting. Like another thing with linked lists is like you can get into recursion and that kind of stuff. You can use that a lot for linked lists. So that's really interesting. And so they show some different cases. Like if we have empty linked list, just return empty linked list, like nothing. Um, if you have empty for one of them, if you, like, you don't have anything in this list, then just return whatever is in the other list. So then here are some of the constraints for this. And yeah, both are sorted in non-decreasing order, just meaning that it's an increasing order. I really get annoyed with this term, <laughs> like non-decreasing. Like they could just say, I don't know what, or I guess, or I guess they might mean non-decreasing. They just could, yeah, I, I guess it is sorted still. Mm, it's a sorted list, so I'm assuming the lowest. Okay, wait, I'm reading the chat. If two nodes have the same value, which one goes first? Nah, it doesn't really matter. You decide. Like it literally doesn't matter because they just care about the value. Uh, it's a sorted list. I'm assuming the lowest one. Yeah, sure. It could be like just uh, just you choose. Yeah, L1 will go first. And same value. I think it doesn't matter. Yeah, exactly. So if we go to the examples, which one? Merge two lists. I guess we went through it so we can just talk about it so we don't run out of time. Um, so this is how they define the linked list class or like, I mean, a list node. In this case, they just call it list node, but the other one I showed was called node. So they have an integer of value and then they have a next pointer to the next list node. And then, like I was saying, there are a few different um, like constructors that you can have in Java. So this is like, oh, if you want to define an empty one or if you wanted to define just the value or if you don't want to define the value and the next pointer. So that's what's interesting about Java. Like you can do that. And say we define the class merge two lists. In this case, we're being sent just the head pointer to L1 and L2. And what like I did here is just define the node as just a new list node. And so we like basically because we need to return, we know we need to return another list. So let's create a new one. And then we're going to add stuff to it. So there are three base cases. The first one. So that's where we get into like recursion and kind of in like linked list and other data structures. So first, the first base case. So you always want to like think about base cases when it comes to like linked list, trees, all that stuff. Like base case first and then recursive case or whatever, like iterative or something. Like I don't know. Just that kind of stuff, like stuff you you want to make sure that is like you want to return early first. So if the first list is null. And the second list is null, just return null. Like that's the header, the header will point to null. That's all we, we care about. We don't need to add it to the node because whatever. We're the, then it will it, it's still just gonna be null. And if uh, L1 equals null, just return L2 because just like in the example that they showed, that means that list is empty, just return the second one. And then same thing for the opposite way. L2 is null, return L1. The recursive case is yeah, this is why I chose this link this question because it's not too hard, <laughs> but it still shows some in, like important things of linked lists. So if the L1 value, so the the value for that node that we're looking at is less than or equal to the L2 value, then we're going to take our node, like our new linked list and add and take that value, like L1's value. And then we're gonna say, oh, the next node, we're gonna actually call this recursively. So merge two lists and we're going to move the pointer, like move um, which head we're sending. So, we're, so we already used that value from L1. So we're going to move it to the next one, but we haven't used any of the values from L2 yet. So we'll just uh, send L2, like, like again, send that same head and then otherwise do the opposite thing. So that way we're just gonna go through both lists. And at the end, like, and at the end, like since this is recursive, it'll hit one of these base cases as well. Like it will just, uh, return L2 at the end, like say we went through all of L1, but there's still like three elements in L2, it will just return L2 eventually. Like it will just return like maybe those three remaining elements. And then at the end of all this recursion stuff, then we just return node, which is like the head of our of our new linked list. So that's what is happening there. Uh, yeah, same value, okay. So if you have any questions about this, 
let me know. There are a bunch of linked list questions that are really interesting and so many patterns that you can go to with like with linked list, which make them interesting or like finding like cycles and linked lists and that kind of stuff. And I surprisingly have seen a lot of linked list questions in interviews for some reason. I don't know why. Like one interview I had with some company in California, they, the guy was just like, I'm going to give you all of the questions are going to be about linked lists. And they're just an increasing <laughs> difficulty. So that was fun. And yeah, so yeah, you can practice that kind of stuff. Like that's why it's good to do like a deep dive into different topics because you never know where they're going to pop up and you might like need to know all this stuff and everything is connected anyways. So yeah, you need to know recursion and then this stuff will help you with trees and that kind of stuff. So yeah, that was the example for this. I kept it simple for this one. Oh, cut line 23. No, Donna. Okay, so basically that's saying um, that, okay, so we set that, say we had the linked list like the same as this first one. So we had the one, one. So in this case, um, say we're just going to take, because we said less than or equal to, so we're just going to take L1. So we're going to take this one and then we're going to add it to our list. But then we need to say like, we don't want to modify this value. So we need to say that the next time that we're going to modify it, we want to modify whatever this is pointing to. So then when we return something again, it's going to add it to the next node of this. So like in this um, return case, like what this is going to return is a is another uh, node. So that's why we need to say, we don't want to overwrite node.value. We need to say like that next one is going to be like node.next. I don't know if I explained, not the recursion. Oh, not the recursion part. It was basically, we're setting the value of the next one. Like we, we have, we have found the current one. Now we want to tell our new list, what is going to be the next one. So that's like, cause the linked list and everything is connected. You don't want to overwrite stuff. We don't want to overwrite the one we just added. We want to find the next value that we need to add. But then we also need to move things forward. Like that's the thing you're going to learn in your algorithms course is that you always have to move things forward. Like, and you're going to be, it's going to be a lot of theory and a lot of like writing, like loop invariants and everything like that. Like preconditions, post conditions, loop invariants. It's going to be like a lot of comments above your code explaining what it's doing. And in that case, you're going to have to explain like, what is the loop invariant? How are you moving things forward? So the way we're moving things forward is we're always decreasing the amount of um, nodes that we are like going through essentially. So in this case, we, we decrease, like we move forward the head of L1. And that way we call this entire function, but using like, uh, like less values essentially. And in the other case, we do the same thing. And then that will return the node because it's just calling the same thing. It returns node and we set node dot next to that. And then it will go again and again and just, yeah. Oh, I think of the next part. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yes. So yeah, it's just like defining what is the next thing we're pointing to. Um, let's go on to what's next. Stacks, yay, fun times. So a stack is a data structure where we push and pop from the front or the top of the stack. I always got these mixed up like stack and queues in high school because like they say LIFO and FIFO, like last in, first out. But basically, the way that I remember this is when people compare stacks to a stack of plates because I'm more of a visual person and just thinking about, okay, you're putting stuff on top of like, you're stacking plates, you're stacking books, you're always, you you put the plate on the top, it's the last one you put on, that's the first one you take off because you're not gonna like try to break all the plates and take something from the middle or from the bottom. So that's how I remember stacks. And this is like an empty stack, you're pushing things and you're popping things. Like those are two key words, like the two methods that like you're most likely going to use with stacks. And they can actually be represented in two ways. So it would be an array or like a list in Python or a singly linked list because you're always gonna be trying to like, um, you're, you're going to be, you don't want uh, both sides to be accessible because you're only trying to take things from the top. So from like the head. And then when we might use a stack are in these like 
following problems. So you might want to use it for task scheduling questions. So I actually had a question like this for Twitch. For Twitch, it was task scheduling. And it was like my first interview. And yeah, but that was more like graph stuff. It was more graph things, but similar type of concepts. Like, yeah, you want to like say you have different people and then they're trying to figure out like, oh, they have a, um, you're trying to figure out like when your task is due or something, but I don't know how to explain this properly. <laughs> uh, yeah, but task scheduling. I think you can search up these types of problems and you'll find them. But I think they're more common for graphs essentially because you might have like, oh, one task and then it relies on another task being finished or stuff like that. So you, you might see those more frequently in graph questions. And um, undo and redo questions. So we're going to be doing one of these as an example, as our last example, because we're running out of time. And um, parsing questions. So one of the questions I put in the list of like, ex like practice ones is like the, the really, really, I guess, famous or what, like, I don't know, used a lot question, which is valid parentheses, where it's like automatically you think use a stack is just pushing and popping things and then making sure they're equal. So that stacks. And queues. Queues are similar. And that's why everyone groups them together. But a queue is a data structure where we push to the front and we pop from the back or from the bottom. Depends like how you're representing it. And or like, yeah, which way you want to see things. So it's FIFO first in, first out. And Another way that I recommend thinking about it is people compare queues to a queue or like a line of people. So people line up and then the first person to get there is the first person who comes out of it. So like if you're early, you get out early. And that's why we can represent it as an array or also as a singly linked list with a tail though. So the two words that are important here is NQ and DQ. And in Python, it's really easy because you can also use like a deck or whatever. Like you'll learn this as well. Like in the future, like there's another um, data structure you can use, which is called the deck, which is like a doubly ended queue where you can uh, take things from both sides. But in this case, we're just using singly ended queue. So that's why we use single, singly linked list. So NQ means add to the front and just add, add, add. And DQ means taking out from the back and or like technically front or whatever. And when what might we use a queue is typically in breadth first search in binary trees. So if you search up how that works, you'll usually see a queue being used, like that's the easiest way. And yeah, or like for like graphs or anything, breadth first search is usually used with queues or like queues usually used for that. Oh, a deck. Oh, yeah, but deck is spelled differently. Stacks are used for DFS. Oh, you can use many different things. for Deck is spelled this way. This is pronounced deck, but it's spelled like weirdly. Or I think that's how it's spelled, if I remember things properly. And let me see. I think we have example. Next. Which example did I choose? Backspace. This one's fun. This one's also kind of annoying, but fun. And I want to see what you think for solutions. So remember to type those in chat. So given two strings, S and T, return true if they're equal when both are typed into empty text editors. The hashtag or pound sign, which is actually called Octothorpe, if you didn't know. So this is called, this thing is called Octothorpe, but let's just call it the pound sign or whatever. It means a backspace character. And note that after backspacing an empty text, the text will continue empty. So let's look at some examples. Yes, Octothorpe. Good job, Michelle. <laughs> You're a real one. <laughs> you know the dictionary. So <laughs> S could be A, B, pound, C, and T could be A, D, pound, C. But they're both the same. Why? Because when we go through this, when we see the pound, that means we delete what's behind it or in front of it, technically. Whatever is in front of it, we delete. So then both of them will become A, C. So that's why we return true. And then in this one, we're going, we see A, B, and then two pound signs. So that means we delete uh, B and we delete A. 
because it says uh, after backspacing, I'm just gonna, yeah, okay. Or just like, yeah, we'll see. Because first we go through it like this, because we go through like iteratively. So we go through A, then we go through B, then we see the pound. So that means we delete B. Then we're left with A pound, and then we see the pound, and then we delete A. So that's why it works that way. So then we see in the uh, string T, we see C, and then we uh, delete it, and then same thing with these. So they both become empty, so that's why it's true. This one is also true, delete A. And then um, because there's an em empty deletes, empty, like because the, then this would be deleted, and it just become pound C, but then pound does nothing, so you just delete that, and it just becomes C, and then both of these become C. This one's false because this becomes C while this becomes T. Yes, any any ideas of what we can do or any um, clarifying questions that you would ask first? So that would be very good. So you always have to make sure you ask questions first. So give it a char, push it, and give it a hashtag, pop it, then compare. And what data structure is that? Jada, what do we do? Stack, okay. Are we, I know, like, are we going to use a stack for, well, like, one stack? Or how would we do a one stack? Also, make sure if your stack is empty and you see it, hashtag don't pop. Yes, exactly and you just don't add the hashtag to the stack. But yeah, no, two arrays, you could do two arrays as well. Yeah, it's two well stack, we could implement it as array. So technically it is an array, but I guess like in, yeah, like we will implement a stack, but yeah, we need, yeah, two string builders. Yeah, Jada knows all the, all the Java. I don't even remember Java anymore. Uh, <laughs> So, so yeah, basically we need two stacks, one for S and one for T. And yeah, in the follow-up, there's like, oh, can you solve an O-N and O one space? Interesting. So if you can talk more about that as well, if you have any ideas, let me see. I named this backspace. So what I did was you can actually just name stacks as well, like, Java just has a stack defined, but in other, um, like in other languages, <clears throat> you can just define stuff yourself as well. So in this case, we're sent to two strings S and T. We define two stacks. What we do is the same thing for both. So if I were a developer in an actual company, I would move this into a reusable function and just call it twice. <laughs> so Yes. Yeah, we can think about the, <laughs> the old one space. You know? uh, so basically, loop through the string s and add it to stack one, popping if we see the pound sign. So this is the for loop, basic for loop, same thing as we always see. And we're going to use the char at uh, like function or whatever, because we're working with strings and we need to see the specific character. So if the character i is equal to pound and the stack is not empty then we pop it so see we're doing that extra case because we, we don't want to pop if it's empty because then it's just going to freak out and be like why are you popping an empty stack and otherwise we're going to do another if statement so it's like oh if it actually is um pound or if it does not equal pound then we push it to the stack, whatever the character is. Then we do the same thing for t, and we return if they equal. They're equal. Easy peasy. If I, it is kind of annoying, like to think of, like this part, I guess, like the, the empty stuff. I guess yeah, making sure that that works well. But yeah, stacks are bad. Stacks are useful. Yeah, easy peasy. Yes. Okay, let's go back. How much time do we have? Oh, we only have 10 minutes. Oh, you understood. Yes, Michelle. Yes. <laughs> good job, Paul Greg. Good, good. I'm proud. Okay, example problem. We did that. 
I don't know if I want to go through sorting algorithms. Uh, I'm, oh, you're lost. No, no. Uh, okay, we'll we can actually go to like 9.30. Oh, really? Well, sorting algorithms? Okay, well, okay. Let's just do speed run. <laughs> I don't know. Well, let's see. Let's see. I don't know. Sorting algorithms are fun to learn, but in theory, you're not really going to have to implement them because, like, you're just going to be like, ah, uh, dot sort or something, like whatever um, like programming language you use. And internally, it's probably going to use like quick sort or something. But we can talk about those. But yes. Oh, yeah, show me bubble sort. OK. Is sorting bad for time complexity? Yes, collections dot sort. Uh, hmm. Sorting is not bad. Like, you're going to have to use it in a lot of times, but like, in the question I showed before, like it wasn't necessary to sort it because we didn't need to. But you should just know, like if you're going to sort something, the fastest sorting algorithm is going to be like it's there. It's proven to be slightly less than n log n, but we just for now we say n log n. But um, like some people have been proving like faster time complexities for it, but it's still not like O of n. O of n is like always like the the thing we're praying to get like what we want because that's the like as fast as possible as you can get it like if if you need to go through all the elements essentially but if you need to sort something it's n log n and if you don't have to then don't do it so yes just keep that in mind so sorting algorithms we're going to talk about the really bad ones first and then the good ones the one there's two that are o of n log n so we'll talk about that. OK, <laughs> this is my scary slide. I kind of gave up at this point to make things look pretty. Um, and I just copied <laughs> from someplace to show an example. And bubble sort, because I wanted to show like uh, what things will look like. So let's say we start off with this array, 5, 1, 4, 2, 8. The first pass of what bubble sort does is it compares the first two elements and swaps since 5 is greater than 1. So it swaps those. And then it goes to the next one and swaps that because five is greater than four. And then it goes one, four, five. And then it just keeps swapping, it keeps going. But then it's not going to sort them in one pass, essentially. It's going to keep, you have to keep going until the array is actually finally sorted. Uh, but the algorithm doesn't know if it's complete. The algorithm needs one whole pass without any swap to know it's sorted. So it's kind of really bad. And Bubble sort is basically the simplest sorting algorithm, and it works by repeatedly swapping the adjacent elements um, if they are in the wrong order. So that's what you're seeing here. And it's like the most fundamental way to sort things. And we'll see it's implemented and the time it takes is O of n squared because the way that it's implemented, like I was saying before, is it has two for loops inside of each other, like or like nested for loops. So that means you're going through like one element and then you're going to the other one swapping them blah 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 going over and over and that's what makes it o of n squared because you have to go through each thing like multiple it multiplies so it's not a great runtime and the bubble sort will be the first sorting algorithm that you will learn so this is the code for that yes i j j i yeah that's a better way to swap them okay then there is insertion sort. So insertion sort is a simple sorting algorithm also. And that works similar to the way you sort playing cards. So if you are playing like Uno or something or like some card game, like usually you want to sort stuff and like in your when you're holding it in your hands and the array is virtually split into a sorted and unsorted part and values from the unsorted part are picked and placed at the correct position in the sorted part. So basically the algorithm to sort these in ascending order of like the array of size n is that we first iterate from array one, like array at uh, index one to n, and then we compare the current element. So see here we're at four, we compare it to, or sorry, sorry, three, we compare it to the predecessor. So everything in green, we're, we're talking about those. So this is the current one. And then we're comparing it to what happened before it. So we compare it to four. And if the key element is smaller than its predecessor, then 
also compare it to the ones before that as well. Keep comparing it and then move it, like move all of the elements that are bigger than it one position up to make space for the swapped element. So this is kind of how it's going. So three moves because it's bigger or it's less than four. And then here in this case, we, we check all of its predecessors. So that's kind of, uh, it makes, it's a little bit smarter than um, by, uh, what is it? Uh, bubble sort because it's doing this in like a single pass kind of like intern like it's it's kind of like going through it like all the predecessors instead of just like waiting for the next pass but it's still o of n squared time when we go to the actual code and we see the code it's still it's doing like in this case a for loop and then a while loop inside of it because basically we're going through the array we set the key and then we find out what was the predecessor, what was the index of the predecessor, and then we're going to go like kind of backwards and then do the check on all the predecessors, like, oh, is our thing less than that? And then like that kind of thing and make those swaps. So yeah, yes, yes. So it checks everything in yeah, red, yeah. Yeah, Michelle, that was how it was going in the previous thing. It checks all the stuff in red. So in that case, Yes, this code. So this is how insertion sort is working. It's still not good runtime. So don't use insertion sort, even though it's like sorting as a card game. Like that's how I always remember it. As you can see, I remember things with analogies, which is helpful for me, I guess. And selection sort, again, ugly slide. This is also O of n squared. So say we're starting with this array. And then basically how it works is like, it works by repeatedly finding the minimum element, considering ascending order from the unsorted part and putting it at the beginning. So it kind of, it maintains two sub arrays in the array. So the first one will be the sub array that is already sorted. And the second one is going to be the sub array that's unsorted. And in every iteration, the minimum element from the unsorted array is picked and moved to the sorted array. So the first case here, we're starting at the Okay, we found the, we went through the entire array and then we found the minimum was 11. So we placed 11 at the beginning. So then that's our new like sorted array. Then we go through from 12 to 64 and we find the minimum. And then we find it, or we went from 25 to 64, sorry. And then we find, oh, the minimum was 12. Let's put that at the beginning. Because we, we always have to keep like moving things over. And then we find the minimum in the other stuff, like from 25 to 64 like over here. 22 and then so on and that's how this one works so everything on the left of the current is sorted let's go up and checks again select it but michelle you're talking about this one or the previous one so everything on the left of the current is sorted yeah yeah, yeah yeah that's how it works yeah if current it moves the current up yeah yeah, yeah. it will it will always move the current up because in the previous one, insertion sort, like in these two cases, it was like it like 10 and then checked everything before it, nothing, like there was no problem. It's in the right order. And then it went up to 12 and then it did the same thing. Nothing was a problem. Then it found one, then it had to do all this stuff again. So it, that's also something that we need to keep in mind with insertion sort. So selection sort, there's also not good time complexity. Same thing, all of n squared. And it's still two for loops, very depressing, never code with multiple for loops. And like, I mean, nested ones, of course. So one by one, we remove the boundary of the unsorted subarray and find the minimum element in the unsorted array. So we're finding the minimum index. And then we swap the minimum index with the first element. So that's the swapping part. And we keep doing that for each element that we see, like we saw. Yeah, totally don't always use bubble sort. Yes, but bubble sort is like everyone's favorite. <laughs> and yeah, so this is interesting. Like it's it's cool to see how everything works internally to help you understand like why to use something or why not to use something. That's why I would say it's good to always look internally to data structures or any algorithms or like, yeah, just try to understand the theory. Don't just be like, ah, yes, I should use this in this situation. Like, well, like I said before, understanding is most important. And that's like the number one thing 
and it might take time to learn things, but just just believe in the process. I did not know any of this stuff in high school properly, and now in university, I know it better. <laughs> like I don't, can't say that I know it very well, but I'm much better at it, and I can practice it, and I guess that's that's an improvement. And even though actually algorithms is like my worst class, just because I took it with a really hard professor it was during COVID, it was like in the fall, and I had a bad mark in the end. Even okay, I had okay at the end, I had fifty three percent, but the two smartest people in my class had fifty six percent, and then my teacher had to curve us all up because everyone's marks were terrible. So that just speaks to how hard the course was. And after that, like he literally drilled it into me. So that's how I was able to do well in interviews because he drilled it into me and it was he was such a great prof. So that's why I take it. I took it with him. So so I I'm not the third smartest. I don't know. I don't know what everyone else's marks were, but it was a hard course because the each uh, test was just multiple choice. So if you get it wrong, you just get it wrong and you just you just die. <laughs> oh, who's the prof? Uh, at York University, it's Andy Merzayan. He studied at Princeton, so he always talks about Princeton. So he's super smart. And yeah, so 50, 56 people, I think the highest mark that someone got in the class was uh, B plus. So they did not get curved to 100. So it was like a maximum like like 80% or, or like even less than 80, like 79%. <laughs> so it was pretty bad. But he's a really hard prof. But I'm going to take advanced algorithms with him because I like him so much because he like he makes you get things and he forces you to think. So that's what's fun. Okay, two more, two more, and then we can do questions. So merge sort, merge sort is really fun. Merge sort is a divide and conquer algorithm. That, why is it called that? Because it divides the input into two halves. This is where we get all the log n stuff. This is why I keep talking about log n, because when you divide things, logs become involved <laughs> with them, and then what happens? Why is it called merge sort? It's because you mer you gotta combine things back up. Like, see over here, everything's going down. But then it, we combine it all back up. When we go back, there's divide and conquer. So it's like, why is it called that? It's because we're dividing things. It's kind of like with recursion. Like, why do you do recursion so that you can divide stuff to make it smaller problems so it's easier to solve? So it's the same thing with merge sort. It's like we want the problem to be smaller. We want to just like get it down to sorting to two elements. Like here, we think that yeah, the numbers indicate the order in which steps are processed. So first we split into two. Then we split this next one into two. Then we split it into one, and that's where we compare. This is like the, oh yeah, this is the merging part. Uh, so then we compare, we're like, oh yeah, 38 and 27, which one's bigger, which one's smaller? Oh, 27, then we combine it. And then we do the same thing. Like it's kind of, it decreases the amount of work you have to do when you make things smaller and then you combine it back together and you do things for every, all of that. And then at the end, it's all nicely combined. So basically what happens internally is that um, we have a specific function called the merge function, which is used to merge the two halves. So the merge function would take the array, the left, the middle, and then the right like indices that you're trying to split it by. And those are like, that's like the key process. And it, uh, it assumes that the array from the, like the left to the middle, and then the array from the middle plus one index to the right, those are already sorted and then just combines those into one. And then let's see, oh wait, did I not include? Oh yeah, I didn't include the code for this because it was too long. <laughs> it couldn't fit on the slide. So I didn't include the code. Oh my God, merge sort. Merge sort is really fun. Let, should I just search it up? Merge sort. Oh, we actually have searched Java. Yeah. Mm, well, whatever. Merge sort. Oh yeah, I will say Java. Anyways, we can. Geeks for Geeks is good. I stole the picture from them. I'm pretty sure. Where's the? Okay, Java. So. This this is the merge function I'm talking about. So that's okay. Where's the div divide stuff? So, it's going to be calling the. I feel like it's calling the sort algorithm. Yeah, it's just, it's calling this sort one. So this is the main function that's going to use to sort stuff. And basically it's saying, um, find a middle point and then sort, sort this one. And then like the two halves, but also call the merge. And then internally in the merge, it's like what it's actually doing. It's 
it's doing all the work basically. Yeah, it's pretty long. That's why I didn't include it. But this is what it's internally doing. And yeah, it's creating temporary arrays, sorting them, but it's better time complexity because there's no, you see like there are while loops or like for loops or whatever, but they're all like not within each other. They're on the same level. So that means it's, ju it's not, it's just O of N like for this merge function. That's why it's much better. Yes, Jada, thank you for sharing. So yes, look at this solution and explanation for merge sort and time complexity. Oh yes, this stuff is so much fun. <laughs> oh my God, all this stuff, yes. And then all oh, applications, okay. Let's go back to the slides, let's look at. So merge sort is cool. The thing that you're gonna be using, like usually what languages use internally is quick sort. Um, it's also a divide and conquer algorithm. But what happens is that it picks an element as a pivot. So it's going to partition around that pivot. So that's why it kind of like, it chooses a number that's like better than, like because merge sort, we know we're just gonna split it in half each time. But quick sort tries to make it a little bit better because it tries to like look at what we have originally and try to split it like in an optimal manner, essentially. Quick sort is best sort, Leo, yes. So. Yeah, it partitions around the yeah the specific pivot. So there are many different ways that quicksort can choose the pivot. So it can always pick, say, like the first element as a pivot, or it can always pick the last element as a pivot, or it can pick a random element, or it can pick the median, or whatever. Like it, there's so many different things. But the key process in this is like there's a partition function, which uh, and the target of partition is that given an array and an element x of the array as a pivot, put x at its correct position in, so in the sorted array and put all the smaller elements smaller than x before before x and put all the greater elements that are bigger than x before, after x and all this should wait is this a linear time why did i put wait wait let me search quick sort quick sort why did i let me see this let me see this implementation yeah it should Let's see, let's see. Oh yeah, well it's the same, okay. Same picture, cause I just saw it, but basically, maybe make it, okay, well this didn't help. But they're partitioning as an example around 70 as the last, el they're just, cause this is unsorted obviously. So they're just cho choosing a random element, which is the last one. And then they're splitting it so that all of the elements um, before 70 are put into the left side. And then, then they choose the last element again. So it's a recursive, essentially, like you're always choosing the last element. You're splitting, you're splitting. And uh, that's what's happening on the right side as well. So how does this work? Do they have the actual code or just pseudo? Okay. Let's see. So there's a quick sort function. It takes the array and then it'll, why is this low and high? Hmm. Oh, okay, it just took a, Oh yeah, because I guess it's recursive. So like the original one, they're just like, okay, just take the like zero as the left index, like the low index, and then the length as the high index. And then, yeah, there are worst case scenarios too, yes. But they always try to choose like the most optimal thing. And in this case, it's just the last one. Um, so PI is partitioning index. And what we're going to do, yes, it's calling the partition function and sending these. And then it's going to sort each element after the partition. So it's going to call this again and again. And the partition function is here, takes an element as a pivot, places the pivot element at its correct position in a sorted array. And place is all smaller. Yeah, so we explain this. Like, then we choose the pivot, which is array at high. So that's like the last, that's how they're doing it, the last element. And then the index of the smaller element and indicates the right position of pivot found so far. So yeah, we're getting the last thing. Yeah, looping, looping, fun times. If current element is smaller than pivot, then increment index of smaller element. Oh yes, there's also a swap. They like internally made a swap thing, uh, which is above here. They made another function called swap. Uh, swap is what's going to actually do that work internally. Yeah, so 
it's really it's just sorting it, but it's just choosing a pivot to make things simpler. And yeah, I don't know. Sorting algorithms are fun. Maybe you've seen there's like some YouTube videos about like sorting algorithms, like visualized, and those are fun to watch. So you can search those up. Those are interesting. That's like all we would do in high school. We would just watch those videos. Oh, I don't know either. I think it's general time. Quicksort and Mercer have the same complexity. Why would we use one over the other? Hmm. Not sure. I guess. I guess people just decided to use Quicksort. Like, I guess once it comes down to they're the same time complexity, it's just like preference, I suppose, or whatever is easier to implement or something. I'm not sure why some like specific languages chose quicksort. Some of I, the times it's, yeah. Do you know? I think it's because um, quicksort is still faster than merge sort in most cases. Oh because yeah. Because yeah. the time complexity doesn't necessarily prove anything. Like I'm yeah. pretty sure bubble sort versus, so uh, no, wait, sorry. Like if you, like two N and N are both mm -hmm. big O of N, but obviously N is going to be faster. And this is like one of those yeah, cases. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and yeah, like we saw, quicksort is already smarter. Like, in some cases, not going to be optimized, but it generally should be better than merge sort. So that's why they would use that. And in the future, there will be better algorithms than quicksort, hopefully, and we might use that instead. So it's just, yeah, whatever is the best, that's what languages will use to implement their sorting algorithms. And yeah, I'm done. <laughs> it's too much. Okay, let me send you the link. Okay, yeah, I have an email, YouTube, Instagram, or Twitter. Everything is just my name or add me on LinkedIn. Let's ask questions. Let me, how do I stop? Okay, stop sharing. Let me stop presenting and let's just, let's just talk now. <laughs> Yay, this is too much. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, you already have it on Hack It Forward. Nice. Thank you. I'm bad at presenting things. I've never had to talk about this or explain this stuff before. So that's why I don't know how to explain things. <laughs> but it is helpful to explain stuff. Yay. Thank you, Emily. Yay. I'm happy you understood stuff. Yay. Oh, you're going, no. <laughs> I wanted to talk with people. <laughs> Sad. Well, does anyone have any questions? Well, I just wanted to say you did a very good job. Yay, thank you, William. Be being able to actually teach the subject means that you understand it very well. And I mean, I've I already have a lot of knowledge in uh in Java because I've I've done it in uh, college the the class. Oh, nice. But yeah, like it, it it all made sense and like it, it was pretty much all uh, accurate. Oh wait, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I'm just like, oh no, <laughs> people are gonna call me out on me not knowing Java anymore. <laughs> yes. uh, it's all right. <laughs> oh, Even after okay. a few weeks, a lot of the stuff. This this yeah. has been more of a a refresher. <laughs> than yeah, anything. no, I. But it's I haven't pretty, used it. Yeah. 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 I have no. I used it actually one time at work, but I haven't used it like other than that, like in the past year. But yeah, what is the application of Java in real life? How is it? different from something like say JavaScript. Um, well, Java, a lot of, like, okay, sometimes it's used for Android development. So yeah, for mobile development, Spring Framework. Yeah, I haven't used Spring Framework, but it's it's used in like, yeah, Android development, but sometimes most people use Kotlin now, which is a different language. But the thing that I used was, oh, hello, William, now I can see you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, people turn on your camera so I can say hello. Yeah, so JavaScript is like front end stuff. It's like what you see on the screen usually. People don't usually use JavaScript for back end programming languages. Like it's it's not generally used, but Java could be used for like the back end. And then um, the thing that I used it in was actually Apache Druid, which is like some open source um, this open source thing for data engineering, which is really good for storing data, um, it, like based off of time. So I don't know if people know databases or like how data is stored, 
but this is based on like indexing on the time columns. So that's why that's really good. And then it was just implemented in Java. And there's like so many commits and so many lines of code. And it was a humongous repo. And I've never used Java in like the workplace environment. And that was crazy. And it was like open source. So like learning to work with these people is cool. Uh, JS, yeah. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. JS for like, yeah, Node and stuff. Yeah, I have used Node. But I mean, yeah. It's, all, it's not just like you use vanilla JS, like there are the frameworks for it, but it works to use Python. Yes, I use Python all the time. Uh, data engineering is generally Python or Golang right now. I don't know like why this thing was implemented in Java. I think it was just because they could do certain optimizations using Java. Or like maybe the people, like sometimes people are just like, oh, I know this language, therefore I'm going to use it. Oh, for the challenge, how are you judging this? Oh my God, is that how challenges work in this? You didn't explain this, Leo. <laughs> you didn't explain how challenges work. Oh, for this one, um, it's usually the execs kind of help do that. And uh, we also do have lead code, right? So okay. people can just run it there. Uh, okay, I didn't know that this was like an actual fancy thing. Okay, okay, cool. I just threw some random questions that I thought would be fun. So <laughs> enjoy. Yeah, it's, it's, it's mostly based on how much you like you've learned in the workshop. It's not really about like really how efficient it is. We just want to see that you you're, you demonstrate that you understand the material. Oh, fancy, yes. Now, leak code is just for fun. Yeah, you, you don't worry about it. It's just to practice. Yeah, for fun. <laughs> you no, know, some people who I know, one of my friends just did leak code for fun. Like, we, we would just be sitting after class and they're like yo hold on I'm, I'm bored i'm gonna go on leak code and just do that and i was like why why is this your hobby now and they would just do that nonstop. but it helped them prepare for interviews and they're really good at interviewing now oh oh my god no algo expert we're not gonna make you pay like a hundred dollars for basically leak code so i don't know i don't know does anyone have any questions about stuff how to get into Java. Oh, Java. Oh, okay. Three questions. Okay. How to get into Java. What does this mean? <laughs> I don't know. Or how do you understand Java? Like, hmm. I guess the way that I understood it, but basically learning object oriented programming is that, um, I guess I read a textbook and that was really helpful. And also the YouTuber, What's his name? The New Boston. The New Boston. I watched his videos and he's just like so nice. And the way he explained stuff was so cool. And he just did a bunch of examples. And every time I was learning something, I would go and watch a video from him to understand the concept. And yeah, reading books like those, like the head first into Java or like head first into whatever programming language, those books are really fun and easy to understand. And they kind of helped me understand object oriented programming, which is like, the main thing you need to know with any programming language and like or not any programming language but object oriented ones like java so i would like say that those were the best resources and just like taking a course in school like really solidified my learning and it was like an advanced object oriented programming course and that really helped and do you go to uni yes i go to york university i'm going to my fourth year i need to sign up for courses in a few days so i got to choose them courses and Jada asks, what's the cryptography course? Cryptography course I took in third year or like, yeah, in the fall. And um, it was it was supposed to be taught by one of my prof favorite professors, but then I think he got sick with, sick with COVID so then he couldn't teach it. So it was another professor and this professor sucked. And but he was actually like this guy who works in the industry. Like he's not, he's like a, what is it? Like a visiting professor or something. Or just like some person who actually has a job but then they just, do teaching on the side like one course occasionally so he did that and it was basically learning about like all the like i guess all the algorithms for cryptography and basically um i don't know implementing those <laughs> learning about why we do this stuff learning about public keys private keys basically Kind of an intro to cybersecurity. Well, we do have an intro to cybersecurity course, which I also took, but that's not 
much coding. That's more of just like opening a VM and doing stuff. So basically encryption and decryption? Yes, yes. And everything around it? Yes. And there are so many assignments like actually implementing this stuff. So the those are difficult to do, but it was interesting. And it, it just like goes dairy in detail. And there's math involved. So have fun with math in cryptography. Um, what, what about the course code? Oh, yeah, I thought you were going to say that. I think it's 3482. 3482. Oh. <laughs> Only take it if Hamza Rumani is teaching it. No one else. No one else. Um, what's the hardest interview question you can remember? Mm, uh, I think it was just like any graph question I got because I wasn't confident with graphs. So then that's why I selected it, like to do those types of questions because I didn't practice graphs enough or like I had just learned graphs. So then at that point I was like, oh, I don't know what to do. So practicing those is important because those questions will come up. Um, yeah, and I think like the Twitch question I got, or like, no, the weirdest questions were from Figma because those were just like very, I guess, intense or something. They weren't too difficult, but then I don't know why they just made it. I kind of, I don't know. There's a lot of wording, I guess, and just many steps to do the question. There's like always something next about it. And like, you don't know, like you, you should ask when you're in an interview, like, oh, how many like parts are there to this question so that you know, like how much time you should roughly take? Because a lot of the times the question might have like four parts and then you're just stuck on part one. So you might, you need to hurry up and that kind of stuff. Um, how would you recommend getting better at competitive programming? Oof, when do I even know this? Um, yeah, make Leet code your hobby like my friend did. <laughs> just make Leet, <laughs> just, just, just change your mindset into like that you love coding and you love algorithms and data structures, which is true. Like I really do love this stuff and I enjoy it and I like reading about it in my free time. Like. On my bookshelf over there, I have all these thick algorithms textbooks that I, I enjoy reading sometimes, but not all the time, but they are cool. Like it's the 1000 page book that you'll use for like all your courses in university plus the graduate courses use it as well. It's super like intense. It has a lot of information in there. And just like, yeah, people read stuff online or write stuff online. It's fun to see that. I think yeah, like watching other people solve things is interesting, like competitive programmers or just like people solving questions online to see how they think about it to get like that intuition. And then, um, yeah, just practicing things. And I don't know, it's not like something that you have to do. Like to be a programmer, you do not have to be a competitive programmer. But if that's something that you like to do, then obviously working on optimization like speed is the most important thing probably like optimizing your stuff and speed so make sure you're practicing a lot getting faster and i don't even know it's just yeah like i said at the beginning it's it's your own style of learning for anything really all i can do is give a few pieces of advice that might work for me but it might be different for you of course um anything else so can I hack now? No, I'm not. I, I don't want to hack. Yeah, I did implement AES. And no, my I had a group. So then we had to split up which uh, people implemented what. So I implemented AES algorithm. Other people implemented RSA. You get graph questions and stuff. Like more advanced jobs and co-ops. Yeah, not like if you're applying in third year, that's when every company wants you but the interview questions are harder. So um, if you're like first year, second year, it, I guess it depends on the company. Like they might just have a high standard for everybody. But if the company specifically is like, oh, we're hiring first year people or like second year people, then they expect less from you. So you'll not get those types of questions usually or it'll be easier stuff. But actually, like I had an interview at Microsoft and Microsoft gave me like the two easiest questions ever or like the or not the two easiest like there were three interviews for the on-site and like um, the first two interviews were super easy. And then the third one was actually interesting because the guy was, we were talking about linked lists and how to optimize something specific in like linked list cycles, I believe. And it was just like 
a super minute thing. It's like a, a minute optimization problem. And that's just because that guy was insane. Like he's a principal engineer. So that means like there are different levels in engineering. So there's like intern, then there's uh, junior, senior, or like there might be intermediate, then there's senior, then there's staff, and then there's principal. Principal is insane. That's like super smart person. So obviously he wanted to pick my brain. And I actually found that interview the most fun out of the three. So yeah, those, yeah, but I didn't get any graph questions, I believe in Microsoft and I was surprised. Like, why did they give me such easy questions? <laughs> like this is, this is boring. I found it pretty boring when it was like too simple. Um, are, oh, did you get, are the Twitch interview questions on your YouTube? I talk about like, in, I have two videos about like me applying to 40 software engineering internships. And I talk about like what the questions were like, like not the specific questions, cause you can't say that. But like I talked like, about what it was like. And I also made a blog post on Medium explaining the entire process of how I got into Twitch or like every single step along the way, like the online assessment, calls with the recruiter, emails back and forth, all of this stuff. And like every single interview, like what happened? So do that.